Hello and welcome to the history of the Mercury Atlas 6. The Mercury Atlas 6 was the third human spaceflight for the U.S. and part of Project Mercury. Conducted by NASA on February 20th, 1962, the mission was piloted by astronaut John Glenn, who performed three orbits of the Earth, making him the first U.S. astronaut to orbit the Earth. The Mercury spacecraft, named Friendship 7, was carried to orbit by an Atlas LV-3B launch vehicle, lifting off from the Launch Complex 14 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. After four hours and 56 minutes in flight, the spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, splashing down in the North Atlantic Ocean and was safely taken aboard the USS NOAA. After the successful completion of the Mercury 5 flight that carried Enos, a chimpanzee, in late November 1961, a press conference was held in early December. Reporters asked NASA's Robert Gilruth who would be the next US astronaut in orbit, piloting Mercury 6. He then announced the team's members for the next two Mercury missions. John H. Glenn was selected as a prime pilot for the first mission, with Scott Carpenter as his backup. Donald Slayton and Walter Murrah were pilot and backup, respectively, for the second mission, Mercury 7th. The Mercury 6 launch vehicle, Atlas No. 109D, arrived at Cape Canaveral the evening of November 30, 1961. NASA had wanted to launch Mercury 6 in 1961, hoping to orbit an astronaut in the same calendar year as the Soviets did. But early December, it was apparent that the mission hardware would not be ready for launch until early 1962. Mercury Spacecraft 13 began taking form on McDonald's St. Louis, Missouri assembly line in May 1960. It was chosen for the MA-6 mission in October 1960 and delivered to Cape Canaveral on August 27, 1961. Mercury spacecraft number 13 and Atlas number 109D were stacked on the pad at the launch complex on January 2, 1962. As the events of orbital space flights on humans were unknown except to the Soviets, who were keeping whatever knowledge they had a secret, John Glenn was prepared with an onboard medical kit consisting of morphine for pain relief, mepinamine sulfate to treat any shock symptoms, benzlaminate hydrochlorine to counter motion sickness, and something else as a stimulant. A survival kit was also placed on board to assist Glenn while waiting for recovery after splashdown including desalter kits, dye markers, distress signal, signal mirrors, signal whistle, first aid kits, shark chaser, a PK-2 raft, survival rations, machetes, and a radio transceiver. Glenn boarded the Friendship 1 spacecraft at 1103 UTC on February 2nd, 1962, following an hour and a half delay to replace a faulty component in the Atlas's guidance system. The hatch was bolted in place at 1210 UTC. Most of the 70 bolts had been secured when one was discovered to be broken. This caused a 42 minute delay while all the bolts were removed. The defective bolt was replaced and the hatch was rebolted into place. The count was resumed at 1125 UTC. The gantry was rolled back at 1320 UTC. At 1358 UTC, the count was held for 25 minutes while a liquid oxygen propellant valve was replaced. At 1447 UTC, after 2 hours and 17 minutes of holds and 3 hours and 44 minutes after Glenn entered Friendship 7, engineer TJ O'Malley pressed the button in the blockhouse launching the spacecraft. O'Malley said, the good lord ride all the way. And then the capsule commander, Scott Carpenter, uttered the famous phrase, Godspeed, John Glenn. Due to a glitch in Glenn's radio, he did not hear the Carpenter phrase during launch. At liftoff, Glenn's pulse rate climbed to 110 beats per minute. 30 seconds after liftoff, General Electric Burroughs designed guidance system locked onto a radio transponder in the booster to guide the vehicle into orbit. As the Atlas and Friendship 7 passed through, Max Q. Glenn reported, It's a little bumpy out there. After Max Q, the flight smoothed out. At 2 minutes and 14 seconds after launch, the booster engines cut off and dropped away. Then at 2 minutes and 24 seconds, the escape tower was jettisoned. Right on schedule. After the tower was jettisoned, the Atlas and spacecraft pitched over still further, giving Glenn his first view of the horizon. 
He described the view as a beautiful sight. Looking eastward across the Atlantic, vibrations increased as the last of the fuel supply was used up. Booster performance had been nearly flawless through the entire powered flight. At sustainer engine cutoff, it was found that the Atlas had accelerated the capsule to a speed of only 7 feet per second, below normal. At 1452 UTC, Friendship 7 was in orbit. Glenn received word that the Atlas had boosted the MA6 into a trajectory that would stay up for at least seven orbits. Meanwhile, computers at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland indicated that the MA6 orbital parameters appeared good enough for almost 100 orbits. First orbit. When the posi-grade rockets fired and separated the capsule from the booster, the five-second rate damping operation started two and a half seconds late. This caused a substantial roll error as the capsule began its turnaround. The automatic altitude control system took 38 seconds to place Friendship 7 into its proper orbital altitude. The turnover maneuver used 5.4 pounds of fuel from a total supply of 60.4 pounds. The spacecraft then settled into an orbital flight with a velocity of 17,544 miles per hour. Friendship 7 began its first orbit with all systems go. It crossed the Atlantic and passed over the Canary Islands. Over Cano, Glenn took control of the spacecraft and started a major yaw adjustment. He allowed the spacecraft to continue the yaw maneuver until it facing into its flight path. Glenn noticed that the altitude indicators disagreed with what he observed was true spacecraft altitude. Even with the incorrect instrument readouts, he was still pleased to be facing forward instead of backward on his orbital path. The spacecraft moved across Australia and across the Pacific to Canton Island. Glenn experienced a short 45-minute night and prepared the periscope for viewing his first sunrise from orbit. As the sun rose over the island, he saw thousands of little specks brilliant specks floating around outside the capsule. He momentarily felt that the spacecraft was tumbling or that he was looking into a star field. A quick hard look out the spacecraft window corrected the illusion and Glenn was sure that the fireflies, as he called them, were streaming past his spacecraft from ahead. They seemed to flow by slowly but didn't seem to be coming from any part of the spacecraft and they disappeared as Friendship 7 moved into brighter sunlight. It was later determined that they were probably small ice crystals venting from the onboard spacecraft systems. John Glenn said, I am in a big mass of some very small particles. They're brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're round a little, they're coming by the capsule and they look like little stars. A whole shower of them are coming by. They just swirl around the capsule and go in front of the window and they're all brilliantly lighted. Glenn started banging the capsule wall and watched the fireflies come off, just as Alan Shepard did. As the spacecraft crossed Hawaii's tracking station, Glenn noticed a lot of interference on the HF band radio. As he crossed the Pacific coast of North America, the tracking station at Gaimes, Mexico, informed the Mercury Control in Florida that a yaw thruster was causing altitude control problems. Glenn later recalled that this problem was going to stick with him for the rest of the flight. Glenn noted the control problem when the automatic stabilizers and control systems allowed the spacecraft to drift about a degree and a half per second to the right. Glenn switched the control to manual proportional control mode and moved Friendship 7 back to the proper altitude. He tried different control modes to see which used the least amount of fuel to maintain altitude. The fly-by-wire combination used the least amount of fuel. After about 20 minutes, the yaw thruster began working again, and Glenn switched back to automatic control system. It worked for a short time, and then began having problems again, this time the opposite yaw thruster. He then switched back to manual fly-by-wire system and flew the spacecraft in that mode for the remainder of the flight. Second orbit. As Friendship 7 crossed Cape Canaveral at the start of its second orbit, flight system controller Don Arban noticed that the Segment 51, a sensor providing data on the spacecraft's landing system, was giving a strange reading. According to the reading, the heat shield and landing bag were no longer locked into position. If this were the case, the heat shield was only being held against the spacecraft by straps of the retro package. 
Mercury Control ordered all tracking sites to monitor segment 51 closely and advised Glenn that the landing bag deploy switch should be in the off position. Glenn was not immediately aware of the problem, but he became suspicious when the site after site asked him to make sure that the landing bag deploy switch was off. Meanwhile, Friendship 7 was crossing the Atlantic for the second time. Glenn was busy manually keeping the spacecraft altitude correct and also trying to accomplish as many of the flight plan tasks as he could. Crossing over the Canary Islands, Glenn observed that the fireflies outside the spacecraft had no connection with gas from the reaction control jets. His suit temperature felt too warm, but he did not take time to adjust it. The Kanto, Nigeria, and Zanzibar sites suddenly noticed a 12% drop in the spacecraft's secondary oxygen supply. During his second pass over the Indian Ocean, Glenn found that the Indian Ocean tracking ship was in heavy weather. The tracking station had planned to release balloons for the pilot's observational experiment, but instead the ship fired star shell parachute flares as Friendship 7 passed overhead. Glenn was able to observe the flashes of lightning from the storm in the area, but was unable to see the flares. The temperature in Glenn's spacesuit was too warm. It had been since he passed over the Canary Islands early in the second orbit. As he crossed from the Indian Ocean, he tried to adjust the suit's temperature. As he approached Australia, a signal light came on warning him of excess cabin humidity. For the rest of the flight, Glenn had to carefully balance suit cooling against the cabin humidity. While he was still over Australia, another warning light came on indicating that the fuel supply for the automatic control system was down 62%. Mercury Control recommended that Glenn let the spacecraft altitude drift to conserve fuel. There were no more problems for Friendship 7 during the remainder of the second orbit. Glenn continued to manually control the spacecraft altitude, not allowing it to drift too far out of alignment. In doing so, he consumed more fuel than a functioning automatic system would have used. Fuel consumption was 6 pounds, from the automatic tank and 11.8 pounds from the manual tank during the second orbit. This amounted to almost 30% of total fuel supply. Third orbit. On the third orbit of Friendship 7, the Indian Ocean tracking ship did not attempt to launch any objects for the pilot's observational experiments, as the cloud coverage was still too thick. When the spacecraft came across Australia for the third time, Glenn joked with Cooper, re-entry. During Glenn's orbits, Mercury Control had been monitoring the problem with Segment 51. The Hawaiian tracking station asked Glenn to toggle the landing bag deploy switch into the automatic position. If a light came on, re-entry should take place while retaining the retro pack. Given the earlier questions about the landing bag switch, Glenn realized that there must be a possible problem with a loose heat shield. The test was run, but no light appeared. Glenn also reported that there were no bumping noises during the spacecraft maneuvers. Mercury Control was still undecided on the course of action to take. Some controllers thought the retro rocket pack should be jettisoned after retrofire, while other controllers thought that the retro pack should be retained, as added assurance that the heat shield would stay in place. Flight Director Chris Kraft and Mission Controller Walter Williams decided to keep the retro pack in place during re-entry. The California communicator at Point Argelio relayed the instructions to Glenn. The retro pack should be retained until the spacecraft was over the Texas tracking station. After the mission was over, the Segment 51 warning light problem was later determined to be a faulty sensor switch, meaning that the heat shield and landing bag were in fact secure during re-entry. Glenn was now preparing for re-entry. Retaining the retro package meant that he would have to retract the periscope manually. He would also have to activate the 0.05G sequence by pushing the override switch. Friendship 7 neared the California coast. It had been 4 hours and 33 minutes since launch. The spacecraft was maneuvered into retrofire altitude and the first retro rocket fired. The second and then the third retros fired at 5-7 intervals. The spacecraft's altitude was steady during retrofire. Six minutes after retrofire, Glenn maneuvered the spacecraft into a 14-degree nose-up pitch altitude for re-entry. Friendship 7 lost altitude in its re-entry glide over the continental United States and headed toward splashdown in the Atlantic. The Texas tracking station told Glenn to retain the retro pack. 
until the, the accelerator read 1.5 G's. Glenn reported as he crossed Cape Canaveral that he had been controlling the spacecraft manually and would use the fly-by-wire mode as a backup. Mercury Control gave him the 0.05 G mark and he pressed the override button. About the same time, Glenn heard noises that sounded like small things brushing against the capsule. This is Friendship 7, a real fireball outside, he radioed Mercury Control. A strap from the retro package broke partially loose and hung over the spacecraft window as it was consumed in a re-entry plasma stream. The spacecraft control system was working well, but the manual fuel supply was down to 15%. The peak of re-entry deceleration was still to come. Glenn switched to fly-by-wire and the automatic tank supply. This combination had more available fuel. The spacecraft now experienced peak re-entry heating. Glenn reported, I thought the retro pack had jettisoned and I saw chunks coming off and flying by the window. He feared that the chunks were pieces of his heat shield that might be disintegrating. The chunks were pieces of the retro package breaking up in the re-entry fireball. After passing the peak G region, Friendship 7 began oscillating severely. The astronaut could not control the ship manually. The spacecraft was oscillating past 10 degrees on both sides of the vertical zero G point. I felt like a falling leaf, Glenn later said. He activated the auxiliary dampening system. This helped stabilize the large yaw and roll rates. Fuel in the automatic tanks were getting low. Glenn wondered if the spacecraft would retain stability until it was low enough to deploy the drogue parachute. The automatic fuel supply ran out at 1 minute and 51 seconds, and the manual fuel ran out at 51 seconds before the drogue chute deployment. The oscillations resumed. At 35,000 feet, Glenn decided to deploy the drogue chute manually to regain altitude stability. Just before he reached the switch, the drogue chute opened automatically at 28,000 feet instead of the program 21,000 feet. The spacecraft regained stability and Glenn reported everything was in good shape. The antenna section jettisoned and the main chute deployed and opened to its full diameter. Mercury Control reminded Glenn to manually deploy the landing bag. He toggled the switch and the green light confirmation came on. A clunk could be heard as the heat shield and landing bag dropped into place four feet below the capsule. Splash down! The spacecraft splashed down in the North Atlantic, 40 miles short of the planned landing zone. Retro fire calculations had not taken into account spacecraft weight loss due to its onboard consumables. USS NOAA, a destroyer codenamed Steelhead, had spotted the spacecraft when it was descending on the parachute. The destroyer was about six miles away when it radioed Glenn that it would reach him shortly. NOAA came alongside Friendship 7 17 minutes later. One crewman cleared the spacecraft antenna and other crewmen attached the line to hoist Friendship 7 aboard. After being pulled from the waters, the spacecraft bumped against the side of the destroyer. Once Friendship 7 was on deck, Glenn intended to leave the capsule through the upper hatch, but it was too hot in the spacecraft and Glenn decided to blow the hatch instead. He told the ship's crew to stand clear as he hit the detonator plunger with the back of his hand. Detonator plunger recoiled and slightly cut the astronaut's knuckles through his glove. With a loud bang, the hatch was off. A smiling Glenn got out of Friendship 7 and stood on the deck of the NOAA. His first words were, it was hot in there. The astronaut and spacecraft came through the mission in good shape. The fourth orbit. After the return of Friendship 7, NASA had announced on April 19, 1962 that the spacecraft would be lent to the United States Information Agency for a world tour. The tour included more than 20 stops and touching all continents. This tour became known as the fourth orbit of Friendship 7. Mercury spacecraft number 13, Friendship 7, is currently displayed at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for watching the history of the Mercury Atlas 6. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can, if you already have. Thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.